I think it's hard to, to say what makes a great music moment in a film. It's one of those things, if you could quantify it, it would make it easier. I was fortunate to get to meet Elmer um, when I was starting out in the business. I actually wrote him a couple letters, and he was such a wonderful and warm and cordial man. And he responded. I took him out to lunch, and, and, and he said, stay in touch as your career is getting going. And so when I got this job, the first thing that dawned on me was, OK, well, how do I really do a comedy? And I thought about Airplane. I thought about um, Animal House. And I called up Elmer, and we had lunch. And Elmer said, you know, his concept on Airplane was to play completely straight, like a composer who doesn't quite get the jokes or doesn't even see them at all, but, and is slightly overzealous and has fairly bad taste. And that was it. So I just, I wrote down exactly that sentence that, that Elmer said, you know, so I was, as I started on the film, I go, you know, I'm gonna follow Elmer's idea here and just score it from that perspective, and it worked. Uh, I'll fix it. I wanted to create a big orchestral score, really big, really with singers and a hundred piece orchestra and just really go for it. And, and, and I got these sort of looks like, and I think Mike was intrigued by it. Um, and I figured that it, you, you, if we're gonna make, if we're gonna take them off the little screen and put them up in a movie theater, you have to make it feel like a movie. And when he described the Butt Kong sequence, um, I wanted to feel like a 1950s uh, B horror movie, you know, or a monster movie, or Godzilla. That was definitely the idea. Just play it straight, make it bigger than it possibly should be. I tried to create a sense of period to it, that it would maybe move for it feel more from the 50s or 60s. And I think the whole score kind of has a bit of that in it. It's a bit of a writing in a little more old-fashioned style. And I think that's kind of played a little bit more towards the comedy, uh, maybe because I think we used to express seriousness in films. Uh, there are little things were a little more overstated, so that was my that was me taking in what Elmer said about ha maybe not having the best taste and being a little overzealous. Okay, boys and girls, our suspects are on a tour bus we believe to be heading for the White House. When I started writing orchestrally against these very thin pencil tests, it really didn't quite feel like it was. I was going down the right road. It just seemed, I, I think, a, way too big. And I just kept saying to everybody, hey, look, we're going to be in a theater. This is, this, is, this is the theater we're dealing with. And, um, and Mike's just hung right by me. He never hesitated. He knew we were on the right track. And I call, I'd sort of get the description from Mike. Or sometimes I would get typed notes with, at this empty measure, uh, uh, Butthead spits his soda on the TV, you know. Um, and so you had to kind of follow it that way to try to make the hits more apparent for what the animation was going to be. It was really only in the last maybe month or so that we really started to get the full color in. Some of the scenes I don't think I saw in full color until the premiere. It's probably just another bomb threat or something. Okay. Is this the lobby? <laughs> I am Cornholio. I need TV for my mom. It's just the way animation is, and you really have to be imaginative, you really have to know the characters, you really have to understand um, the visuals, and a good pencil test can give you that. You just have to look past it. If you have a team and you have a leader with a vision, you feel fine. And Mike was right, Mike, I mean, he is the boys. So every time Mike said, yeah, we're on the right track, we were good. Mike's a professional musician. And so it was very helpful to have Mike, you know, really hear where I was going with it. When you're working with a, with a real trained musician, uh, it's, it makes things actually easier. It was a very traditional orchestra. We had big horn section, I think we had six horns. I think it was, um, you know, maybe with the singers, it was about 100 people in the room. For the most part, that's what it was, very traditional orchestration. We did a few things, like the, um, we, a few places where we featured the choir, like the, uh, the I guess, I, a lot of people don't know what the lyrics are in the uh, church sequence. Check 
it out, butthead. Porta potties. Cool. <laughs> Mike and I were flying to. We recorded the score in London, and we were flying to London, and, and I said, you know, let's. We have to come up with some sort of lyric. We wanted to have a Gregorian chant in the um, in the church. And there it is, 5M4. And so I didn't want just straight Latin there. And so we came up with um, something that might be more appropriate for the boys. And it says, um, Scrotum agitato ignoremus, genitilus largus, hemorrhoidos burnum, all day long. And so we had these very, you know, traditional church singers, and I, I had to sit there with a somewhat straight face practice them singing Scrotum Agitato over and over and over. And, and here's a song that might help you cope with some of those feelings, okay? It's called Lesbian Seagull. Well, I heard the song where it's placed in the film, in the body of the film, um, in the classrooms. Trees and sand, come with me. Lesbian seagull. The intention really around the song originally was um, was was serious. <laughs> you know, I guess I've probably written serious things that maybe someone didn't take seriously, so that happens, right? Fly high, lesbian seagull. There's some interesting dialogue in there. Do you know? in the hallucination sequence. If you listen to the stuff that they're saying backwards, if you played it the other way, I can't remember exactly word for word what they're saying, but I think if you flip it around, it's things like, I recommend you stay in school. Yeah. <laughs> fire, fire, fire. I suggest that everybody go to college and study hard. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> Beavis' Sperm is one of my favorite cues I've ever written, and it's kind of developed a life of its own, and I'm not quite sure what that life is. Every once in a while, I get royalty checks from strange places for it, like Singapore, and I've even gotten them from, from Eastern European countries, where I think it may be being used as some sort of theme for a television show or something. <laughs> I really didn't score it like animation. I mean, I really scored it as a film. You know, when, when the dam breaks and on all those scenes, I'm just playing disaster movie music. I'm just playing it straight. It really goes back to what Elmer Bernstein said. It's really, that was really the key. Okay, we have the, the montage in the desert, and I want it to be like an old Western. And so you have to have whistling in there. And so I kept telling them that, you know, the, the guys that were putting the, the players together for us in London that we need someone really good who can really whistle and really have it really sing out like, like, a, like in a Western. And they go, oh yeah, we're gonna fly someone in. We had to actually fly a guy in from, from I think, Dublin or, or, or somewhere in the north. And we recorded the orchestra, we're all ready. We got out there in this giant room and we have this one mic and this one guy in the center of the room. And we hit record. It really it sounded, like, it sounded like he had eaten like a handful of crackers. And, um, and so I go, okay, okay, let's try it again. And, you know, I, I like the third take, I kind of, like, I look over at Mike and his eyes are just sort of bulging. And I, and I look at him and I sort of nod and go, that was good. Okay, we're done. And then we, we, had to, we had to figure out how to do it. We had to bring someone else in. Of the end of the film, the walk into the sunset, which is um, you know really like almost 1930s 
or 40s writing. It's the, it's the end. It's it's the way films used to, you know, when they had, uh, you know, I wanted it to sound like when they had the, the letters, the words come up the end on a film. Completely play against uh, all the names that they're calling each other. And, and uh, that was really fun to do. You just write the biggest, sappiest, most over-the-top melody I could possibly dream of. And that's, I, that is the biggest and sappiest melody I've ever dreamed of. You can just tell when the inspiration's there, when, when they when they heard the music and they had a vision for it, it, you can just tell. It's one of those things you can't, I don't think you can really teach to somebody. I remember how jubilant we all felt after our first preview because um, we were very nervous to play the film and we had the right crowd in there and the film ended and then someone yelled, play it again. Aha! Ah <laughs>